So this right here is my Vim configuration file, and as you can probably tell, it looks a little bit differently to the way that it normally does. In fact, I've got no lines configuration in here, and everything is being done from sourced files. So you might know that this looks a little bit similar to the way that I'm doing my shell configuration, where basically I'm sourcing all of my aliases from a separate file to make it so I can easily move between ZSH and Bash without actually having to go and modify my configuration file. But you also probably know that there's not really a reason why you'd want to do that with Vim. If you're going to be using Vim or you're going to be using NeoVim, it's not like you're going to switch between them. You're going to be sticking on one of them. So why exactly would you want to do this? So what I've effectively gone and done is modularized my Vim configuration. So when you go and do this, there's a bit of a trade-off you get when it comes to debugging. So if you didn't know, when you actually go write a command inside of your Vim configuration and it's a command that just doesn't make any sense and then you try to load up a new instance of Vim, what it's going to do is basically tell you, hey, that command doesn't actually mean anything and it will tell you the line the problem is actually on. Now, when you go and actually do this with the sourced files, you don't actually get that same sort of feedback. Basically, when you try to open it up, it just doesn't work. But what you do get is the ability to disable parts of your configuration and then test them one by one. So if you know that there's maybe going to be a problem in a new part of your Vim configuration because, I don't know, you're writing that part, you can go and disable that part and then try to fix it without it being enabled and then re-enable it and just keep going back through that cycle without having to worry about the rest of your configuration being affected. So for example, let's say I want to go and disable all of my auto commands. Basically, all I would have to do is just comment out this line right here. And if I go and open up a new file, let's go into my ZSHRC. Basically, when I go into insert mode, what's going to happen is it should center the screen if I have my auto commands enabled. But if I go into insert mode now, as you can see, that's not actually doing anything. So let's go and just re-enable that and reopen the file. So save this file reopen my ZSHRC, and if I go into insert mode now, as you're going to see, it actually centers the screen. So that's how easy it is to disable parts of your Vim configuration. And because you've got everything split up into separate files, it's incredibly easy to maintain. So let's say we want to go and modify something in my basic settings. All I would have to do is go into wherever that's located, so that will be in my configuration folder, in my NVim folder, and all I'd have to do is just modify that file. So that was the basic setting file. And I can just go and mess around with stuff in here. It's not like I have to go and dig through my entire configuration file to find where a specific setting is. I know that all of my basic settings are going to be in the basic settings file. I know all my plugins are going to be in the plugins file, so on and so forth. And because you've got everything split up into separate files, it makes the maintenance dead simple. So let's say I want to go and modify some of my basic settings. All I would have to do is go find the file. So that is going to be in my NVim folder and in the basic settings files. And rather than having to dig through my entire configuration to find exactly where this is located, I know that all of my basic settings are going to be in the basic settings file. I know all of my auto commands are going to be in the auto commands file and so on and so forth. Obviously, the way you have this split up is going to really be dependent on what you want to do. You could have stuff split across multiple files if you wanted to, or you could have one mega file. It doesn't really matter how you handle it, as long as you handle it in a way that, I guess, makes sense for yourself. And because you've got everything split up into separate files, it makes the maintenance absolutely dead simple. All you have to do is go find the file you want to go and modify. So let's say we want to modify the basic settings file. I'm going to go into my .config folder, into my nvim folder, into the basic settings file, and this right here is where all of the basic vanilla settings are being set. I don't have to go and, you know, dig through my vim configuration. I know that all of them are going to be in this one file, and they're all very, very easy to find. Now, obviously, you could go and lay out your vim configuration in a way that makes it so everything is easy to find, but you sort of still have to remember where in the document that block is actually located. Whereas if you do it in this way, you know, okay, it's going to be in an entirely separate file and you know all of the settings are going to be in this one place. And obviously how useful this is is really going to depend on how well you actually make use of these files. Obviously, if you start splitting stuff across multiple files they shouldn't be in, it will still work, but you won't really get the same sort of benefits from the separation. And one thing that might not be super important for you guys, but is kind of important for me, is doing this makes sharing your Vim configuration, or at least sharing parts of your Vim configuration, incredibly easy. 
Obviously, sharing the entire thing is going to be slightly harder, but if you just want to, say, share your basic auto commands, or you want to share your plugins, or you want to share your CRC settings, anything like that, Basically, all you have to do is share that one file and then they can source that in their own Vim configuration and get all of those same settings without having to go and dig through your Vim configuration and finding where you have your stuff in there. And it's just kind of a pain to do that. As I said earlier, if your Vim configuration is laid out nicely, it's not that big of a deal. But if it's a separate file, it does make that separation a little bit cleaner. So in Vim, you always have the ability to resource your Vim configuration file by just running source dollar my vim rc now with vanilla vim this works perfectly fine but it does become a bit of a problem when you start involving plugins because some plugins aren't set up to not reload when you reload your vim rc so what might happen is you might be running multiple instances of those plugins at the same time and obviously that's going to start to slow down your vim and you try to do it again it's going to slow it down again and again and again until the point where vim basically becomes unusable but when you're doing it like this if you just want to resource one part of your vim configuration all you have to do is say, okay, well, I want to say resource, I don't know, let's resource my basic settings or something like that. Uh, so nvim slash basic settings. And that basically just resources that one file without having to go and resource everything else in the document. And this also makes it so it's very easy to load up parts of your VimRC based on conditionals. Now, you might be saying, well, can't I already do this in regular Vim? And yes, you'd be right. But the problem you generally have there is you usually have so many settings in the conditional that you can't actually see the bottom of it. And the problem this causes is you might actually put settings inside of the conditional that you didn't mean to put there because you just didn't realize where the conditional actually ended. So through this method, because everything is being sourced through single lines, generally the conditional block is going to be significantly smaller. Now, one obvious use for this is if you're using VS Code and you want to use the Vim emulation in that, because that doesn't actually support any of the existing Vim plugins. Basically, the only plugins that work for it are the ones that are built into it. So you pretty much just have to make sure none of that stuff is being loaded when you actually open up VS Code, because I think if you don't do that, it'll probably break it. And depending on the plugin manager you're using, you can make it so the plugin will only be loaded when you actually load up its configuration file. But I don't know of a way to conveniently do this inside of Vimplug. I guess I could have it so, I don't know, when you load in the configuration file, it will set a variable. But that's not really a simple way to do it. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this in some other plugin managers. So I might try something else out. But if your plugin manager does let you do that, then this could be a pretty good reason to use this. Now, this does come with a slight performance hit when you're trying to load up Vim, but on my system, the difference is completely imperceivable. The only reason I can even say there is a difference is simply because of how a computer works. Because you're running extra commands, Basically, this must mean that it is slower than reading from the file directly. But unless you're on really slow hardware, it probably won't be an issue whatsoever. So the reason why the files end with .vim actually has nothing to do with getting this to actually work. Pretty much the reason why I've done that is when you end a file in .vim, it basically tells vim, okay, this is some sort of vim script file, I should do vim script syntax highlighting on it, and basically it just makes it so, you know, you get your same sort of syntax highlighting that you'd get in the regular configuration file. You don't have to do that if you don't want to, but I would really recommend it just to make it so it's a bit easier to work with. Now, if you're not a fan of this method, there is another way you could handle it. Basically, what you would do is have a shell script that effectively is a build script for your VimRC. So you would still have everything split up into separate files like this. But instead of sourcing everything, what you would do is just generate a full VimRC file. So basically, you'll just cut out all of these files and then whatever the result is would be your resulting VimRC. Now, my issue with this is that every single time you want to change your VimRC, it would require you rebuilding the file. But... It does remove the issue of having to source everything. It's sort of a trade-off for what you'd prefer to do. So let me know, do you think there's any real point in actually doing this? Or is this just sort of reinventing the wheel for the sake of reinventing the wheel? Let me know what your thoughts are down below. Personally, going forward, I'm going to be running this because being able to source individual parts of the document will make it easier when I'm trying to test out new plugins. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I want to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Corbiniana, Andrew Craig, Nathan Montezar, Joseph Pitadi, Road, Tony Donald, 
John, Marek, Mikel, Nephite, Spagin, Thais, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there'll be some links down below to my Patreon, subscribe star, my coin train, all of that sort of stuff. If you want to go and watch my podcast, which is just all rambling nonsense, that's available on Tech Over T, and that's available on Library and YouTube for the video version, and the audio version is available anywhere you listen to audio podcasts. This channel is also available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute as well if you're watching it on YouTube, and personally, I would prefer if people go watch on those platforms. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.